I'm very honoured to have been invited to say a few words to you today and also to come to this meal. We had some very interesting discussions over lunch, um, mainly about education and about the um, requirement for state schools and in, indeed free schools and, and other schools within the um, maintained sector to have an act of common worship each day and whether there was any chance of that perhaps not being the case in future. We were also talking, I, was, I, I didn't realise, I mean this week um, obviously we had the sad death of Tony Benn, his funeral a couple of days ago and he was my successor in my constituency, he represented Bristol East and I'm Brist he represented Bristol South East and I'm Bristol East and Keith, um, w one of the things obviously we were discussing with when we were talking about Tony Benn's legacy was his attempt to get the law changed so that he could renounce his hereditary peerage but I hadn't realised that Charles Bradlaugh from the NSS had fought um, an equal important battle when he was first elected I think it was back in the 1880s he said and um, Tony Benn of course had to fight a couple of by-elections before he was allowed to stand having and, and renounce his hereditary peerage but uh, Charles I think fought about four by-elections because he refused to swear the well he didn't quite refuse to swear the oath when he was elected to parliament but the he was told that because he was so obviously renowned as an atheist he wasn't allowed to so they had this sort of ridiculous farce where he couldn't be sworn in so he had to stand down and fight a by-election got elected again couldn't be sworn in etc etc and eventually i think after about four um by-elections he was allowed to affirm the oath which i think is some, something I'm, I'm glad there's going to be efforts to mark that in parliament because uh, it's a little bit of our history that seems to have been forgotten um, but in, in terms of, as, as Geoffrey said, I mean, today is incredibly timely because of the uh, legalisation of equal marriage and the fact the first marriages took place this morning. And I sort of felt as I was walking through Soho, there was a little bit of buzz in the air. And, and certainly Twitter was absolutely full of people saying, you know, as, as soon as it turned midnight and the first marriages started to happen, it was absolutely full of people saying, you know, what a momentous occasion this was. And if anything crystallised that conflict between religious belief and other human rights um, it was the same-sex marriage debate over the past year or so that um, yeah you saw you know, the likes of Norman Tebbit and it's actually his birthday today so happy birthday Norman um, <laughs> I hope he's been invited to some wedding parties to celebrate but you know you saw the likes of him saying this is going to force me to, to marry my son or something bizarre like that and um, I saw Twitter today um, Ed Balls was being accused by someone of being a sleazy atheist and my colleague Johnny Reynolds was being told that he had sold Britain to Satan and um, there was somebody else tweeted that Britain has now been marched towards the edge of a cliff of Marxist depravity and um, somebody else said we've now been it's the end of this as a Christian country we've now been taken over by Satanists and blasphemists so obviously the battle hasn't been totally <laughs> some people might think that's quite a good thing but I mean so obviously we haven't totally won the battle and I think the debates did show the extent to which some people's hearts and minds need to be won over and um, as Keith said I'm a shadow foreign minister within my portfolio I've got the shadow human rights brief and that means that I have a lot of contact with people from other countries where they're fighting the battles that, that we've fought for many decades and in fact in, in some countries such as Uganda they're actually going backwards. Um, Dr Frank Mugisha is a very very brave campaigner for gay rights in Uganda. He says he's one of only about 10 very openly out people there and he took over as um, director of the sexual minorities of Uganda organization his predecessor David Cato was murdered because a local pa a paper had outed him he won a court case because they were basically saying go and lynch him um, he won the court case against them got damages but was still um, murdered um, by homophobes and Frank has taken over his mantle as incredibly brave um, Russia as well, you sort of see with the, the, the crackdown, I don't know if people saw the dispatches program, Hunted, which is about packs that actually go out and chase um, gay people on the streets and, and torture them, and, and there's been some a couple of murders there as well. And what's very interesting in Russia is that I think Putin, I don't think Putin is a religious man in himself, but I think he has used that um, religious conservatism and the power of the Orthodox Church in Russia to serve his own ends and to sort of boost his, his own popularity. I went out to Russia for the um, trial of Pussy Riot, and that was a classic case. You know, they, they were 
sent to penal colonies um, on charges of hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. But it was a trumped-up charge because they actually just dared to stand up to Putin, challenge his machismo, challenge his authoritarianism, and express a different view. So religion there is being used as a, a tool of state suppression, even though I wouldn't say that uh, Putin himself is doing it through motivated by his own personal faith. So there's a huge amount that, that needs to be done in winning those arguments. One of the things that's particularly worrying is the extent to which American influence is creeping into Africa. And I've heard American evangelists say that they've lost the battle in America, it's a godless country, but let's go to Africa. And when you talk to people like the Ugandans, I was at the Commonwealth Conference um, last summer, and had to speak about the Commonwealth Charter, which is meant to be about everybody signing up to the same values, the same shared human rights. And when you got to the bit about gay rights, obviously there was uh, then this sort of flicker, but you know this doesn't fit with our religious beliefs, and that same old debate. But one of the things that was said to me is, you brought religion to our country. We were okay with, um, you know, we were told by you that homosexuality was wrong. And now you're coming back like the colonial masters and telling us that actually we've got to drop that bit of the Bible and just listen to the bits of the Bible that you want us to believe in. And, it's, it's, and you've got American evangelists going in saying, no, no, stick to what it says in the Bible. So there's, there's a really interesting debates to be had, but quite frightening in terms of the um, impact it's having on people's lives, the dangerous situations it's putting people in because of that increased religious focus in those countries. Um, so I think I've probably said enough and we ought to get onto the awards, but I think this, the, 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 the battle for... As, as we saw during the same-sex marriage debate, there was, the debate was very much about people's freedom to be religious and not about the freedom to not have any religious belief at all. And this was something we were talking about over lunch. And I think we need to come up with a, a sort of firmer agenda as to what we mean by a secular society. Because I think at the moment... It's, the dialogue is so much about respecting faiths. So whenever there's community consultation, it's faith groups that are brought in to make sure that you're not offending the Muslims, you're not offending the Sikhs, you're not offending the Jewish community. It's very rare for anyone who's of no faith at all to be brought in into that dialogue. As a, an MP, I frequently have to go to mosques, I go to temples, I go to a lot of religious church services. And I go along with it because I'm very polite, so I cover my head if I'm in a Gurdwara and the religious books are bought out because that's what you do to respect their religion. But at the same time as an MP, if I was to say, actually, I'm not comfortable in going along to something that's a religious service, I'd probably be totally pilloried for not showing respect to them. But you could argue, well, where's the respect for the fact that I don't, yeah, I feel a bit of a fraud taking part in some of those ceremonies. And I would actually think that sometimes that some respect should be given to my atheism or to just to my desire not to play along with things that I don't believe in. And I think educate... <laughs> and, I, and I think education is absolutely key, um, as, as we were saying over lunch, that... At, at the very least, let kids just be kids and not have religion forced upon them. Let them make up their own mind and um, not have this act of common worship and let them develop themselves and not have religion getting in the way of things like sex and relationship education and all those sort of things that are so important to teaching kids. So anyway, I'm sure I've spoken for enough already. So over to the prizes.